hello good afternoon so uh, sasrikal and copy to all uh, before the introduction of uh, our worthy resource person professor dr vinu kupal ji i on the behalf of our college management dav cmc staff and students welcome and thank dr vinu kupal for joining this online platform google meet i am pretty sure that today's activity is going to be very interesting for students as it will be like a real time visit of research labs of premier institute of our country tata institute of fundamental research mumbai the main attraction of today's webinar or today's tour are showing optical and terahertz spectroscopy labs and clean room thin film deposition and characterization different types of lasers and spectroscopic techniques etc sir on our college has been awarded the dvt star college scheme by ministry of science and technology government of india as this event is sponsored by dbt thus i want to describe the objectives of the scheme so the objective of uh, uh, the star college scheme can be described by smart smart means strengthening of infrastructure for science labs motivating students for hands on practical training augmentation of interdisciplinary projects are refinement and repair of existing labs equipments training of teachers and lab staff so to achieve uh, these objectives our dbt team of physics and chemistry faculty members are putting their best efforts even during this period of spread of covid-19 pandemic we have organized many online activities like webinar poster making competitions virtual lab training online activities etc today's event is first of its kind the virtual tour to research labs as per the recommendation of our advisory committee from this platform i would like to request to my worthy team members and scheme coordinators to organize activities related to interdepartmental workshops and interdisciplinary projects so without taking much time i hand over the control to harpreet kaur prad teaching faculty of our department for introducing our esteemed resource person thank you over to um, professor harpreet kaur prad uh, good morning everyone i on the behalf of dav college management committee and department of physics at dav college batinda welcome our esteemed resource person for today's event dr venu gopala janta uh, sir welcome uh, to our college uh, webinar uh dr janta is uh, presently serving as professor at department of condensed matter physics and material science at tata institute of fundamental research mumbai his research interests interest include nano photonics and planar architectural architectures for classical and quantum information processing he has more than 120 research papers to his name he is also on the editorial board of scientific reports frontiers and encyclopedia of applied physics He is a senior member of IEEE and executive council member of Optical Society of India. So uh, definitely he is uh, a renowned name in the field. Sir, we welcome you, and we hope our students will greatly benefit from this virtual tour. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am, for uh, uh, giving me this opportunity. What I would like to do is like give a brief uh, introduction using some PowerPoint slides. and then uh, take to the lab so that uh, students will understand little bit of what we can do the facilities okay. so i'll share my screen yeah so uh, our lab is called uh, photon lab so that's the acronym for uh, fundamental optics terahertz and optical nanostructures i'm uh, um, gopal okay so um ours is basically a laser spectroscopy lab so laser applications are uh, everywhere in everyday life like so we are using lasers mostly like like for example what we will be using is the uh, laser in data storage for example or lower d drives right communication for example fiber optics 
all our mobile phones everything is based on uh, nowadays on on fiber optic communication networks if uh, people also use lasers for uh, um, welding and cutting diamond uh, polishing diamond cutting right in barcode scanning from 1970s like so this is being used then laser and heat treatment spectroscopy holography and most importantly for medicine so for example lasik got the laser eye surgery using lasers is is very uh, uh, popular nowadays it's very quick and uh, relatively painless surgery so lasers are also used in magnetic resonance imaging in uh, eye treatments and and cancer treatments so lasers are everywhere okay so if you look at it like so laser is used for cutting laser is used for drilling laser is used for uh, engraving right so it also has lots of different applications for example for guiding right uh, if you want to target your uh, bullet somewhere like you have this laser target trees then you have this high intense lasers mounted on for example lasers which you can use to um, melt or or bombard um, enemy positions or you can use uh, this truck mounted lasers to blast away air aircraft this uh, is sorry somebody saying something okay right. so uh, people also use this for for uh, it is for or dvds for example so you have you write your on on the dvd you have this thin metal film on which like you encode your data so wherever you have exposed to laser like you have for example high reflective surface and where it is not exposed so you'll have uh, less reflective uh, surfaces so by scanning the region of the tape or the dvd disc like so you can uh, find out like which is high reflecting and low reflecting eventually that is converted into electrical signal and then to to your sound uh, uh, producing the sound which is on the dvd or the data which is on the dvd right so lasers are also very popular now it is because of the laser invention like so now we have this uh, fiber surgery so uh, laser beams are being used um, through uh, sent through the fibers and used for doing um, micro um, surgeries in, in inside the body right on the other end like so you have huge facilities for example this is a uh, this is inside of a, um, a huge national ignition facility they have a very high intense laser which is used for uh, igniting a, a, a fusion uh, cell right so where the temperatures are uh, sufficient for thermal nuclear ignition so this is used this is being used uh, currently in in uh, us uh, as a facility for uh, basic research as well as uh, uh, for different testing different device applications or, or uh, for different purposes so now nowadays like people talk about this petawatt lasers these are very high intense lasers which can vaporize matter so one single shot of that laser like will vaporize whatever is in its path the typical facility looks like this. this is a huge facility because it's very very high power laser they put anything in the path like it, it just blasts right so it just evaporates the whole thing right nothing can survive that so these are huge laboratory facilities which are being built nowadays on the other hand on the extreme other side so this is one side applications using uh, lasers which are Uh, mountable on a on a truck or or inside a lab, and then you have these huge facilities which are being built as national facilities. On the other hand, you have these very tiny lasers, which are the compact diode lasers, so which you can get uh, for different applications. Right. So uh, one development which led to this is uh, the um, the progress in the semiconductor physics or semiconductor development. Right from silicon germanium, so we have uh, now gallium arsenide, indium gallium arsenide. So these are the compound semiconductors which are very popular. You can tune your band gap of your uh, semiconductor. So the distance, I mean, the separation between the valence band and connection band is the uh, band gap. So that band gap can be tuned by changing the composition of your semiconductors. For example, if you take indium gallium arsenide you mix them in such a way that like they tune your laser wavelength from green to red right so uh, it, it's possible to get multicolor uh, uh, lasers so 
we should also think of uh, people who invented this. So, um, Maiman, uh, Theodore Maiman, uh, is from a uh, huge uh, aircraft company. So, he is showing a, a ruby crystal here, right? So, which is the first uh, uh, laser um, ever built. So, it's on, based on a ruby crystal. And this is Ali Jevan who made the uh, uh, first gas laser, which is a helium ion uh, mixture of gases, which is used to um, um, uh, for laser application. So then this is Arthur Shallow showing the so-called uh, ring dye laser, right, where we can tune the color of the light. So these are like ruby or, or uh, uh, helium ion lasers, so they have fixed one single color, one single wavelength of frequency. Color of light is related to the frequency or the wavelength of light. So you can only get one single light from these, but if you have a dye laser, you can tune your uh, color of light or the frequency or wavelength of light. Right. So this was uh, Arthur Shallow and uh, he got his Nobel Prize in uh, 1981. So um, the miniaturization, which is possible because of the semiconductor development, is uh, um, can be, uh, when the credit goes to Robert Hall, who invented the first semiconductor laser. And uh, this is uh, uh, Nick Holenia, who uh, invented the uh, light emitting diodes. Um, right. So here he's comparing his device with a, nowadays what we can get like very bright LEDs which we are using in, in our uh, homes. Okay. So parallel to this laser development, which I am showing that like miniaturization high power lasers are also possible in semiconductors. Semiconductor revolution also reduces the size of electronics. For example, in computing, right, you have a huge room full of uh, um, modules to form the first computer, which is known as uh, uh, ENIAC, right? So it's an electronic numerical integrator and calculator. So this was built in 1946. It has 18,000 vacuum tubes. A vacuum tube is a, is a big uh, device, um, which is used, uh, uh, which was used earlier before diodes and uh, transistors, semiconductor based uh, transistors were, were uh, invented. So it consumed 150 kilowatt of power, right? And it took two years to build this uh, entire uh, huge computer. On the right hand side is shown, uh, for example, a, a, a corner of a room, you can uh, have a computer. So this is the first generation, uh, 1954 computer based on transistors. It used 800 transistors and 10,000 germanium rectifiers. And compared to 150 kilowatt power, this used only 100 watt of power. So that is thousand times less power if you use semiconductors. Okay? And then the size also came from one room full to one corner of a room. Okay? With, from 1954, so 1947 was a transistor invention and seven years later, the first transistor based uh, uh, computer was built. And then we kept on making smaller and smaller and smaller uh, chips. Right? And uh, then, like, so we are packing more and more transistors into our chips. So the latest, what we have is uh, AMD 7 nanometer CPU. So this is claimed to be the best CPU in uh, 2020. So, for example, if you take a Ryzen 7 3700X CPU, it has 3.8 billion transistors, right? It's of the size of 1 inch by 1 inch and thickness of few millimeters. So in that, there are... 3.8 billion, so that is 380 crore transistors in this small chip, which is inside our computers, inside our mobile phones. Okay? So this is compared to 800 transistors which were there in 1954. In, in about like 70, 65 years, we moved from say 1000 transistors to 380 crore transistors on one single chip. Okay? So this is all possible because of the development in, in uh, semiconductors. So what is for the future? We are packing more and more and more transistors into the into our chip. Will it really increase the speed? Will it will we be able to increase the speed of the computing with the electronics forever? So maybe not. So what are the alternatives? So one alternative is to use uh, the so-called optical integrated circuits. So here, instead of electrons passing through one part of the circuit to another part. So we envisage that like so you launch light into it, the photons will move from one, one part of the circuit to another part. 
the entire computing, entire logic operations are done by photons and not electrons. The reason is, I um, mean, the advantages of photons are so they they do not inter interact with each other like electrons. Electrons are charged particles. If two electrons come to close together, so they repel. Okay. So here photons can uh, travel uh, together without much of a um, problem. Okay. And uh, another thing is like, so you can have fastest um, possible circuits. So compared to electrons, the, the speed of light is the fastest. So you can always travel, uh, you can always do your computing or the logic operations at the fastest possible uh, uh, speeds if you use light. So this is possible. So people, uh, there are companies which are making this. For example, this is a circuit which is available uh, in uh, communication network. So in communication network, one of the problems is when we're talking to mobile phone, we are talking, it's converted into electrical signals. But when it has to reach you, in between it's converted to photons, right? And then the photonic uh, signal is transmitted through fiber optic networks. And then when you receive it on your PC or in your mobile phone, so it's again converted into uh, uh, I mean electrical and then to sound. Okay. So you need electrical to optical. So whatever I'm talking, uh, talking, so that electrical signal has to be converted to optical, sig uh, sorry, um, optical signal. And then at your end, optical signal has to be converted to electrical signal. So these are called EVO electro-optical converters. So this is an electro-optical converter where you have like, for example, 10 channels, so 10 devices. So 10 of us can talk simultaneously. So each of the each of our signals is coming through one of the wires here. And then each of our signals is modulated at different frequencies and then converted into light and, and uh, modulated and then launched into this optical fiber. So this is each channel has about 10 gigabit per second and gives about 100 gigabit per second um, uh, electro optic conversion. So this doesn't mean that like we are competing with electronics yet. The reason is electronics have hundreds of crores, right? As I said, like it has 380 crore transistors on the chip. Compared to that, a photonic device has only thousand components on it, optical components. So we need to make these uh, circuit, optical circuits to be compatible or competing with electronics, so we need to pack more and more optical components on the chip. Okay. So, but uh, I mean, to achieve this, like, so what do we use? Like, so the enabling fields are we can use the so called photonic crystals and plasmonic crystals. So, what are crystals? We know from our uh, standard solid state physics that crystals are periodic arrangement of atoms. So if you have atoms or ions, ions arranged in a periodic lattice, if an electron comes, electron has negative charge and these ions also are charged, so the electrons get attracted or repelled. Okay. So because of which like you, you get these band gaps. So the band gaps are basically energy bands or energy ranges uh, for which like the electron cannot exist inside the crystal. Which means like, so if you have an electron of certain energy, uh, range so those electrons uh, cannot be uh, uh, I mean tra uh, traveling inside the crystal okay. so um, so these energy levels do not exist in the uh, in the crystal right, because of the periodic nature of so similar similar to these electronic crystals or the standard crystals which we see around us so you can also have these photonic crystals or plasmonic crystals. So these can be used for something called metamaterials nowadays. So we work on these metamaterials. Meta means like which do not exist in nature. Okay. So um, for example, the, these are some kind of early structures which are metamaterial structures which are made. So these are for microwave frequencies uh, which are demonstrated earlier. The the beauty of this is of these metamaterials is that like so if you put for example a a rod inside a glass, empty glass. You see an image like this. But if you fill this glass with some liquid, which has refractive index uh, positive. So, so refractive index is uh, basically C by V. C is the velocity of light inside vacuum and V is the velocity inside the liquid which we are trying to draw. So because of light refraction, you, you see that like light bends 
and then the image, the rod is no longer seen as a continuous rod, but it, it seems as if it is broken. Right? But if this material, if this liquid is not a positive refractive index, but if it has a negative refractive index, if the N is not positive, but if it is negative, then the bending will look as if like it, it's going, uh, I mean, the, the rod is bent in the opposite direction. Right? So these kind of materials are possible to be made now using these metamaterials. Okay. So, uh, I mean, interesting, I mean, though I showed one of these examples of uh, light bending in the opposite direction, you can also think of Doppler effect. In Doppler effect, what we see is that like, when the source of um, noise, source of sound is approaching us, the frequency increases. But on the other hand, if air is replaced with a, a medium which has a negative refractive index, then what we see is uh, when the source is approaching us, instead of increasing, the frequency will reduce right, when it is approaching towards us. So it's exactly opposite effects which we will see if we have a negative index medium. Yeah. So uh, what happens is like um, any material can be uh, defined or explained in terms of two material parameters. One is epsilon, the dielectric uh, permittivity, and the mu, the magnetic permeability. So if you take light, light is an electromagnetic field. It has an electric, electric field as well as a magnetic field. Now if light is incident on a, on a medium, so the medium will respond to the uh, electric and magnetic fields which are inside the light beam. So the response of the material is defined how the material uh, response to the electric field of the incident light is defined by the epsilon and how the material response to the magnetic field is defined in terms of mu. Okay. So in normal uh, conventional materials, what we see around us in every day in, in this world, so they're all having epsilon and mu positive. Okay. But on the other hand, okay, but on the other hand, if you have uh, I mean metal, for example, so you can have epsilon less than zero and mu greater than zero. And if you have magnetic materials, you can have epsilon positive, but mu can be negative. But these metamaterials, which do not exist in nature naturally, so but we can make them, we can design and make them as per our wish. Okay. So these can have both epsilon and mu, uh, which can be negative. Okay. So we can we can be gods in some sense. We can design our own materials now. Okay. So why do we want to do all this? Okay. So if you want, if you have a thought about what happens if you put some object in the path of a light beam, okay, then there is some light source and you put put your hand in the path. What you see is a shadow. Okay. But the shadow is not the, uh, what happens uh, every time. For example, instead of my hand, I put a, um, for example, my hair. Okay, so the light may not see the hair, right? My my hair is too thin. It's thinner than the or, or comparable to the wavelength of light. So then, light bends around the object which it is uh, which it's passing through. Okay. Or, so, if we shine light on periodic structures like gratings, what happens? So, if you have periodic structure, so the light undergoes like maxima and minima. So, you see this interference pattern which has maxima and minima points. Okay. So, what is color to an object? So, from biologists, like, so they say that, like, oh, there are pigments. In physicists, they say that, like, oh, it depends on what is absorbed and what color is different. Okay. And what is Vanguard? So Vanguard is certain energies which are not allowed inside the material. Right? It can be electrons, it can be photons, it can be the so-called plasmons. Okay. So we cannot see an atom with an optical microscope because the diffraction limits. The diffraction limit says that for the photon to see an object, the object has to be of the order of wavelength, or at the most bigger than lambda by 2, where lambda is the wavelength of light. So, for example, if you take blue light, which has 400 nanometer um, wavelength, right, your object has to be larger than 200 nanometer for the blue light to see that object. How do we see an object in the microscope? The light gets scattered. 
right? If the particle is too small compared to the wavelength of light, the wave, I mean, the, the wave just passes through, right, without getting any distortion. So why we are able to see is because there is scattering, there is some distortion in the in the wave front which we are seeing and observing that ah okay there seems something there. Then we try to adjust the contrast and try to visualize like what what that particle is. Right? So if you have a pure photonic structure based on light using light, so you are always limited by the diffraction limit. Okay? So diffraction limit says that. For an object to be visible, for the light to interact with an object, or for scattering and other things to happen, so you need to have the size of the particle to be about lambda by 2 or larger. Okay. So that limits the size of our optical devices. If we take light to the nano world, that is below the wavelength of light. So if you take light to regions which are smaller than the wavelength of light, so beat the diffraction limit, then we can see objects much smaller than the wavelength of light. So we can control the optical properties of materials or nanostructures. Right? Um, we can control the uh, how light is coupled into it and how how we can like we can change its polarization, we can change its intensity, we can change like at what times it's turning on and off. So all these things like so we can manipulate the light if we can take light to the nano world. Okay, so I mentioned two things, photonic crystals and plasmonic crystals. So the photonic crystals are basically, they are available in nature. So these are made of epsilon and mu greater than zero. So they, that is conventional materials. So you see these in nature, so there's a Brazilian beetle, uh, which is an insect. It looks like very uh, shiny green. So if you look at its wings under microscope, it looks like some green color uh, wings. Okay. But then if you take each of these wings and then put it under an electron microscope, which has a very high resolution, so then you can see that each of these wings is a, is a thin film or thin foil in which holes are drilled in it in a very periodic fashion. Similarly, peacock feathers. Peacock has beautiful uh, colors. And if you say blue, it's not just one single shade of blue. You can get like multiple shades of blue, multiple shades of green. Okay. So these come because there is something called carotene. So these are carotene lines and they're separated by air. Okay. So the separation between two carotene lines tell like whether you have blue color or green color. Okay. So if the separation between them is 400 nanometer, you get blue color. If the separation is say comparable to the green wavelength, you will get green color. Okay. But then the width of the carotene line will tell like the separation is constant but one line is bigger than the, I mean, th these lines are bigger and the air is, uh, region is smaller. So that defines like so how much is the ratio between the carotene to air will define like what is the shade of the color which you have. Okay. So butterfly wings are other beautiful examples of these photonic crystals in nature. Okay. So you can make these artificial structures now. Right? Because uh, the credit again goes to semiconductors uh, development in semiconductors where we can make thin layers, monoatomic, so one atom layer by la layer. Right? So you can make these structures by uh, techniques like molecular beam epitaxy or, or uh, MOCBD, chemical vapor deposition techniques. So you can have layer by layer or rods which are standing in air or you take a semiconductor and then you can make holes and drilled in them using nanolithography techniques. Or you can stack uh, rods of uh, dielectric materials one on top of the other to form this wood pile kind of structures. So when you have this, like you can generate these band gaps where photons of this particular frequencies or colors or wavelength, whichever you call, so they cannot uh, travel through this. They just scatter out of the medium. Right? You can generate defects. So you can this can be used for making tiny lasers. So you can modify one of the rods. Either you can change the size of the rod, shape of the rod, height of the rod, right? make some small change, and you can confine light. So because it's a periodic structure all around it, so what happens is the light gets reflected back from the uh, all the regions. So you are confining light to small regions. For example, you put some uh, dye molecule or or some um, a quantum dot, a nanoparticle here. So the nanoparticle emits light and then it gets reflected back 
and then the light gets amplified. So you can have like really tiny, tiny lasers now. Uh, you don't need big lasers uh, and anymore. Okay. So you can generate a line line defect. So these are like a wave gate. You can transfer photons from one part to another part by modifying a row of these rods. Then you can do lots of things with it. Okay. So this is a uh, electro-optic modulator which uh, recently uh, reported. So this is a, like 11 gigabit per second and it uses only 22 femtojoule. It's really, really efficient uh, uh, device. So you can also use it, for example, what we work in the lab is we put a single nanoparticle in the center of this photonic crystal. So we remove the central uh, hole and then this is a periodic structure in which we remove the central um, rod, for example, and then modify the neighboring ones so that we get a, a small cavity here. Okay. So in that cavity, we put is one nanoparticle of like two or five nanometers, something like that. less than 10 nanometer size particle, we put precisely at this position. So then we tune the um, the band gap of the uh, semiconductor nanoparticle and then we, we get this really emission. So the cavity resonance and the quantum dot emission, they are matched together so that like we get this huge enhancement in emission and that we can use it for uh, generating single photons. Okay. If you take light, normal light, so it has like billions of photons. If you take okay. So from those billions of photons, taking one single photon is, is not easy. Right? Nowadays, like people talk about something called quantum key distribution, where like you transfer instead of sending on the fiber like millions of photons, you send one photon at a time. Right? So the advantage is like if you have millions of photons, I can put a beam splitter, right? A, a partially reflecting mirror, for example. So some, most of the light will pass through, but some part of the light I can always uh, steal. Right? Then I'm, I can, I'm stealing your information. Okay? So, but if you have single photon, and if I'm stealing your one single photon which you have sent, then you can immediately know that like, oh, somebody is stealing the data. So the security will be very high. Okay? So uh, single photon sources are very uh, important or interesting uh, nowadays. So we can look using these photon crystal cavities. Okay? So as I said, like so, photonic crystal cavities offer a lot of advantages, but the main problem is their size is comparable to the wavelength of light. So they are still big compared to the electronics. Now, instead of using pure dielectrics or insulator materials, if you combine insulators and conductors, that is metals and dielectrics, if you combine them, you can make miracles. Like so, there's something happens because of which you can take light to nano um, uh, nano domain. Okay. So, um, like, like for example, this is known for a long time. So, in the 4th century AD, people had this magic cup. If you put light inside the cup, it looks red in color. If you shine light on from the outside, it looks green in color. So, that is transmitted light is red and reflected light is green. So, this happens because this, this cup is made of a ruby glass, which has this silver and uh, gold nanoparticles. So they have different scattering um, properties. Okay. So other thing is uh, stained glass windows which we have seen. So there are beautiful designs which are made with, uh, but these are mostly like metal salts which are used inside the glass. They are embedded in to make these designs. Okay. So if you take gold nanoparticles and depending on the size of the nanoparticle, you can get like different colors. Okay. It's the same material, gold. But then the size of the nanoparticle is different, so you get like different colors in this. And not just different colors, so if you look at the transmission and the reflection, so they, are, they show different colors. So the same size nanoparticle shows red in one and orange in the, uh, in the, in the reflection. So you can get um, different um, uh, reflection and transmission properties. This happens because uh, you have um, a particle, so this is a nanoparticle, it's a metal. A metal has lots of free electrons, right? it's a conductor. So that means that like, you have a large number of electrons on the surface of your nanoparticle. These electrons can move as a cloud, so all the electrons can move up and down. Okay? And there is some resonance frequency for, for this movement. Now if you have applied electric field, right? the electric field is a sinusoidal um, field. Right? So 
that matches the frequency of your applied electric field or the light frequency matches with the resonant oscillation of these electrons on the surface of the metal part. Okay. Positive half cycle, electrons are pushed down, the ions are uh, moved uh, to the top and the electrons, the negatively charged electrons are pushed down. And on the other hand, during the negative half cycle, electrons are pushed up and the ions are, are pushed down. Okay. So this resonant oscillation, so because of this, like the energy from the incident light can be absorbed into your nanoparticle. So if it is absorbed, so that color is missing in the in the, in the transmitted light or the reflected light which we are seeing. So that's what gives the colors to these nanoparticle solutions. You can also have this by having a combination of metal and dielectric. So for example, you can take a metal layer and put a dielectric on top. Okay. So you solve the Maxwell's equations and we see that you can confine light to really, really uh, the interface regions, only to few nanometers or ten, few tens of nanometer uh, distance from, from your metal surface, you can confine your light field. Okay? So that can enhance your, if you are, if you are taking light, uh, the electric field to such small, uh, confining it to such small dimensions, you're actually enhancing your electric field density, which means that you can control the electric, uh, the, how the material interacts with, with at such high electric field densities. Okay. So there are numerous applications of plasmonics in biology uh, for cancer treatment, for sensors, right? um, you can have negative index materials, you can go to uh, really sub wavelength imaging, right? beat the microscopy um, problems, right? you can go to um, sub wavelength optical components, you don't need big optical components like mirrors and lenses, you can actually have very tiny um, components now, right? and, and there are huge uh, other things. So one thing, for example, here is a polarization dependent resonances, if you have a pattern like this, and they are of H structures, you can have like if the electric field polarization is this way, it gets transmitted. If it is this way, it doesn't. So now these two resonances, one is for 0.8 micron and the other can be designed for 1.5 micron. These are the fiber optic important um, wavelengths. So you can, depending on the polarization, you can filter your light off. So each of us can have different uh, polarization. So my polarization is horizontal, your polarization can be vertical. So when, when I'm sending light, it gets coupled. And when you're sending your thing, like, so it won't get coupled because your polarization is off. So you can do um, communication for filtering and uh, for uh, multiplexing signals, it can be useful. Okay. Last part, like I'll just very quickly show about uh, what is terahertz. The terahertz is basically between the electronics our present day electronics work up to gigahertz range, right? And the optics or the photonics work from 10 power 15 or the petahertz range. In between these 10 power 9 and 10 power 15 hertz, so there is this terahertz range, which is of the uh, 10 power 12 hertz uh, frequencies, which are very, very important nowadays because it has numerous applications and very little work is uh, still done. Um, it's a, it, it combines the electronics and photonics, right? So it's in between, so it can take best of the both worlds, right? So it has numerous applications, for example, unlike X-rays, which are high energy, X-rays so can have low, very low energy uh, terahertz, so it's less harmful to the body. So it can be used for scanners, it can be used for the imaging, for example, this is for the tooth decay imaging, right? You can, um, uh, estimate the um, physical properties of materials, for example, superconductor band gaps uh, are in this uh, energy range, right? and also the molecular vibrations of uh, uh, molecules, right? the vibrational energies of molecules match with this terahertz range. So you can use uh, this terahertz spectroscopy to it has a, uh, uh, options. So the challenges are like so efficient terror sensation detection, terror materials which are low loss materials, terror spectroscopy, different techniques, and terror near field. So these are uh, all to be developed, and people are working um, to make these uh, things uh, more and more efficient. Okay. So lasers have two types. One is continuous wave, where you have the same number of photons are there throughout in time. In pulse laser, you have bunches. So you have large number of photons in, in a very short time. So you can have femtosecond pulses now. 
So in, in 10 power minus 15 second, you can launch like million per, a million photons. And then for say, for some few nanoseconds, milliseconds or one second, whatever. Like, so for large gap, there are no photons. Then again, you can have a bunch of photons, like you can generate them uh, in, in bunches or, or short pulses. Okay. So the energy of photon is H cross omega or H nu, which nu is C by lambda. So you can, um, H is a Planck's constant, C is the velocity of light. Uh, so if you plug these constants, it comes to about 1.24 divided by lambda. What it means, like you can have 0.4 micron is equal to 3.1 eV, and this is blue light, and 0.8 micron, which is near in the near infrared, the energy is 1.55 micron. So, for example, you can have two photons of 1.55 micron. You can add them together in in something called nonlinear crystals to generate 3.1 eV of light, right? Or blue light. So you can mix colors, mix photons of different uh, um, of one color or different colors to generate a third or. Uh, different color uh, completely. Right. So I show different types of lasers and some experiments we do. So So um, as I said, like so um, this is the linear interactions which uh, chi one even the electric field uh, power one is the normal uh, reflection transmission or dependent on there. But there is an E squared term, E cube term. So this lead to nonlinearities. Linear is E power 1 is linear. E squared, E cube, these are all nonlinear terms. Right? So you can do uh, different spectroscopic techniques. You can generate different colors of light using these optical nonlinearities. Okay? So I'll, I'll show the, I think I, I took a uh, little longer time. So I'll, I'll try and show you the lab now with uh, different uh, lasers and then what we do. So I'll try to connect with my mobile so they see some issue with the network hope it works. If not, like I'll use my
not able to uh, I have disconnected stop sharing but it's not letting me do okay um, okay so um, So uh, this is our uh, optics laboratory. So um, what we have is uh, uh, multiple lasers to begin with. So this is the light source which we use. So uh, one of them is, is this tsunami, which is a pulse laser. It generates uh, 100 per second pulses. Okay. So uh, this emits in the uh, red region. We can tune the uh, wavelength, but it's typically in the in the red region. So uh, the one here which you see, Kimon laser, so that's a helium cadmium laser. Right? And I also showed you one gas, the first gas laser we made is a helium neon laser. So this is this yellow one which you see, this emits again red light. And the, the Kimon, uh, which is helium cadmium laser, it emits uh, blue light, either 325 nanometer or the um, 400 uh, uh, nanometer, 400. Okay. So, Can you see this? Hello? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. 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 Yes. Thanks. I'll, I'll, I'll move slowly. Yes. So this one is a helium cadmium laser, what you see here. So helium and cadmium uh, is a doped in the helium gas. So this generates blue light or you can also generate UV light. Okay? UV light is very faint, but now you can you should be able to see uh, faint blue. Okay? So that's the UV uh, light which you see. Or you can also generate 420, which is like really bright blue which you can see. So this one, as I said, emits uh, helium cadmium, emits uh, red light, and this is a um, solid state laser. Unlike this, these are the gas lasers. So which have helium cadmium and helium laser, uh, uh, helium neon or uh, gases which are used. Uh, there are also high power lasers which are based on carbon dioxide, CO2. The tsunami, this for example, is a solid state laser. So uh, which is a titanium sapphire crystal. It's a Titanium doped sapphire crystal, which is used, and it is pumped by a diode laser, which is a, which is written millimeter here, if you can see. So it basically emits uh, green light in a nonlinear crystal. So the diode laser is uh, below, which emits in the near infrared wavelength that is used in a nonlinear crystal. So two photons of say red are uh, added up. Okay, the sum of and then emitted uh, green uh, laser in this case, green light output. So the green light pumps the titanium sapphire crystal which is inside the laser and then generates the red light of femtosecond pulses. Okay? So these are different sources which we use and we can put our sample in magnetic field. For example, this is an electromagnet which can go up to one tesla of field. Okay? Or we can do it in, in low temperature. For example, we have, um, for example, cryostat. Okay? So, um, so, for example, there's, there's one cryostat here, right? so which can be used for uh, cooling down to liquid helium temperature, spore Kelvin. Okay? So, the light is incident on, on a sample. Okay? And uh, so, for example, the light comes here, so it used in this, uh, um, by the um, beam splitter here, so this goes in this direction here. The light comes here, goes through this beam splitter, using an uh, ob objective, like it goes on the sample, which is inside a cryostat, and then the reflected light is taken off by the same beam splitter, and then it goes to the spectrometer. Okay. A spectrometer detects the, 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 the wavelength, the different colors of light, and what intensity or what signal strength for each color. So, what is the how many photons of each color are there in my signal? Okay. So, that is the, given by this spectrometer. Okay. A spectrometer typically 
as um, it as a structure like this. Okay. I'm just showing my uh, laptop screen. So uh, you have, for example, an input uh, which is coming from this direction, and then uh, a mirror sends it to a to a um, curved mirror, which focuses onto a grating. Okay. A grating diffracts the light into multiple colors, and then that comes onto this different colors come onto this uh, curved mirror again, which will collimate. So, which will send this light uh, in parallel. All the different colors come in parallelly out. Okay, different colors come in different directions, and then there is a CCD kept here at the output, and that will detect like so how many photons or how much of each intensity or uh, how much of each wavelength or each color of light is there inside your signal. A signal which is like this, okay, a broad spectrum light, if there is an absorption, some part of the light is absorbed by your sample, so you see that these particular wavelengths, so this is wavelength on the x-axis and the intensity or the signal strength on the y-axis. So what you see is like some of these photons, these colors are absorbed inside your material. So then you see the dip in your uh, uh, transmission spectrum, for example. So by measuring the spectrum, you can understand like what wavelengths are getting absorbed or scattered inside your medium. Okay. So there are different types of detectors which we use. Um, for example, this, this is a CCD which can detect uh, um, single photons. Okay. So uh, we also have single photon detectors, so which are basically avalanche photodiodes, which you study in your electronics. So the avalanche photodiodes are um, basically you, you um, they are biased, the PN direction which is biased in the uh, negative uh, um, bias mode, so that like when you, even if a single photon comes, right, so it will trigger the avalanche, so the breakdown happens, and then you get a huge current in your output signal, okay, so that's how the like, single photons are detected, okay, so um, we have the similar, uh, I mean, uh, photodiodes which are used uh, for uh, normal detection, For example, here what have uh, is a uh, it is one setup. For example, you can use it uh, use a uh, continuous wave normal halogen lamp. You don't need very fancy uh, laser. Use a five rupee, ten rupee uh, lamp from the market. For example, you see here. So this is a um, small halogen lamp source which you can use to uh, generate a uh, a point. Uh, or a small spot on your sample using multiple lenses, right, and pinholes, okay. And uh, your sample is inside, for example, kept here, and then you can measure the reflection or the transmission. Okay. So you can measure the white light transmission and the uh, reflection. If you want to measure the band gaps, you can do these, uh, uh, you can rotate your sample, and then you can measure, like, uh, the rotation of, uh, will give you the the K, momentum of your uh, um, photon okay, on your crystal. Okay. And uh, uh, the wavelength or the color is the uh, omega. So omega versus K gives the dispersion uh, or the photonic band gap or the electronic band gap of your material. So by changing the angle of your sample, you can measure the band gap of this uh, uh, material. So this is another a uh, small cryosat here, okay, the, the blue one which you see. So uh, you mount your sample inside this and uh, uh, you can go to go and do measurements with uh, 4 Kelvin. You can vary from 4 Kelvin to say uh, 400 Kelvin. So above room temperature you can also heat your uh, uh, sample. There's another kind of laser which uh, we have. Uh, based on the uh, uh, properties which I just mentioned. 
crystallization. We have something called a, a, a photonic crystal fiber which has a large nonlinearity. So you put high intense laser or uh, pump uh, light into the fiber, so you get like you can generate continuous spectrum of all colors in it. Okay? So for example, what you see here is red color light which is coming out of uh, this box here. Okay? So this is red light. So which I can tune just by dialing in. Okay. I can go to here. I can choose, choose the bandwidth of it. So for example, it's at 700. I can move to 575. They say that like I have 50 nanometer is the width of my... Okay. So it's showing from 550 to 600 nanometer wavelength in there. So how does it look? It looks orangeish. Okay. So the same laser you can cover from blue to all, all, all colors are, are possible to be uh, blue to red. Everything is possible to be tuned. Okay. So you can go to say for example 550. How does it look? It looks green. So, six twenty five, this is bright red. Yeah, this is bright red in colors. Okay. So, you can tune these colors. So, one thing I said uh, about the grating okay. grating is a periodic structure. You don't need a very fancy uh, crystal, so you take a ruler. For example, I'm just taking a metal, metallic ruler here. Okay, I hope you can see. So these are different gradations. If you see here, there are inches on uh, uh, inches on the uh, right hand side and centimeters. On, um, yeah, sorry, there. Yeah, inches here, and then you can also have millimeter gradient, or you can have very fine. Uh, sub millimeters uh, gradient on this. So if you look at the uh, light, okay, and then you you make. I'll be able to show you. So what I'm trying to show is like so the the light beam is made to incident at an angle, grazing angle or or some angle, so that you can see the refraction pattern. Yes, I, I'm just trying to probably I'll just switch off the light once. That, that spot uh, basically changes it splits it into splits into um, horizontal spots basically large number of spots that the, the incident beam is, is diffracted. So that means like your light is bending from different parts of the, uh, from, from around the obstacle, right? So the light bends around the, around my finger, for example. So one coming from the left and right, they both interfere and then it forms a maxima and minima. You have destructive interference, then the, uh, the intensity gets cancelled out and you have uh, constructive interference where you have uh, E1 square plus E2 square term where the intensity is maximum. So you can generate uh, destructive and, and the constructive interference patterns which leads to uh, the uh, uh, 
the points which which have like um, a, a single beam is split into multiple uh, maxima and minima. Okay, so that's your diffraction pattern. By measuring the separation between those maxima, okay, so uh, you can get, for example, this is a formula which you can use for measuring, for example, thickness of hair. Okay, so if you put hair. Uh, one single hair uh, of uh, I mean, human or somebody, like you can measure the by measuring the separation, the wavelength of the incident light. Right? Then you have uh, from the center, like so you can choose like m uh, bright spot and measure the distance. Right, so distance between the center to the m spot here. So for example, this is first spot, second spot, m equal to two. For example, you can measure this small d distance. Or in in this case, it's the y m is the distance between the central spot and the uh, and the m spot, and d is the distance from the screen to my laser spot. Okay, so if you use that, you can calculate like what is the thickness of hair. How do we generally <coughs> measure uh, the size of small objects, the uh, thickness and all that? We use a um, for example a, a screw gauge or a vernier canker. So, but if you have, um, if you have really, so here, for example, you have a, uh, a screw gauge. Right? So you open this up, you put your object in the in between these two uh, points, and then you tighten it, and then just it, it measures like what is the separation between the between the two edges. Right? So that's how you measure uh, using a, a screw gauge. Or or even the calipers. Okay, but, but hair uh, thickness is, is very very uh, small compared to what what the resolution, what is the capability of a screw gauge. Using laser light, we can actually uh, measure the uh, thickness of hair. Okay. So what we also measure, right? So what I showed uh, is basically. Um, Reflection and transmission happens. So there is a reflected light. Sorry. So light is incident, and then you have reflected light and transmitted light, and some part gets absor absorbed inside your sample. Okay. In addition to this, right, uh, you have. Sorry, uh, is there anything? Okay, I'll, I'll do and move slowly. Yes, so in between I was walking. So yes, yeah. Right. So here, what you see is there is an incident light, there is a reflected light, and a transmitted light. Right. So what we are measuring is what is known as far field from the surface. Where we are measuring is much much larger than the wavelength of light. But if you go very very close to the surface of the sample, what we measure it's called the near field. What we measure at the near field, very close to the surface of the sample, where the the separation is close to wavelength of light or smaller than the wavelength of light, then the properties of uh, of the reflected and transmitted light could be completely different. It gives a completely different information. Compared to what we measure in the far field, like a far distance compared to the wavelength of light. Okay, so how do we measure these uh, the so-called near fields? Is uh, by using a fiber tube. Okay, so you have something like this, in which in which there is a um, fiber. So this is a fiber which is going here. I hope you'll be able to see. So this is a fiber. So the tip of the fiber is tapered so that it goes to few um, tens of nanometers in, in in dimension. So you are transmitting light through the fiber, and when it goes onto the sample, which is kept on this, which is kept here, for example. So the the sample uh, light on the sample goes through the tip of the fiber, which is. Few tens of nanometer. 
So you can actually go very, very close. You can take the tip very close to the surface of the sample and you can define like 1 nanometer, 5 nanometer or 100 nanometer, you can define that. Okay? And then use the tip to collect the light as well. Okay? Either you can launch light um, using, for example, in this case, you can launch light from the top of this, okay? and then it goes through this objective lens and focus in the far field and collect it using the fiber tip or use the fiber tip to excite in the near field and you can collect using the other fiber, the, uh, the near field the, uh, of the reflected light. So you can use a fiber tip to excite and collect in the near field. Okay. So the near field properties are which are very close to the surface of the um, sample. The distance should be uh, uh, at the most uh, wavelength of light. Okay, so that is if you take blue light, it should be 400 nanometer or smaller. So, electronics, present day electronics, okay, can uh, uh, only show, can only uh, detect speeds which are of the order of like gigahertz. So, for example, you cannot measure anything smaller than say a nanosecond. Okay? So, you have, for example, an electron in the valence band which you are exciting to the conduction band. And then you want to study how that electron is going to come back to the valence band. So some processes happen in very, very short time scales of the order of like say 20 seconds, 10 power minus 15 seconds. Okay. So some happen in, in picoseconds, 10 power minus 12 seconds. So these processes are not possible with electronics. Okay. But in optical domain, using optical spectroscopy, okay, so we can measure these things, measure these time scales of the order of like 20 seconds. So the optical techniques are uh, much, much faster and only limited by the pulse width. And now with lasers coming at like few femtosecond, you can get like 5 femtosecond, 2 femtosecond pulse width lasers. So you can get that much resolution. You can measure lifetimes of the order of like say few femtoseconds of so the optical spectroscopy, which is not possible with electronics. How do we do it? So, for example, the laser light comes like this and then it goes through uh, these apertures. This is to guide light, make sure that that light is traveling, light beam is traveling in a straight line. We put these markers and use a, something called a beast liter. Okay, So this is a, a 5 micron thin polymer. Okay? So, uh, so that like if, if you have a thick glass, for example, glass also reflects some part and transmits some part. You can use it as a beam splitter, so that is splitting the beam into two parts. Okay? But if you have a glass, what happens is the front surface and the back surface will also reflect. To avoid the back reflection, so we use a very, very thin foil. Okay? So this foil reflects and some part gets transmitted. The reflected light goes through these two set of mirrors. It goes like this, come back, okay? and it comes to this mirror here. This mirror which is, which is here. And the transmitted beam from the beam splitter goes like this, reflected by this mirror here, and then comes to the small mirror here, and then it comes to the same mirror here. So these two beams, they come, they travel next to each other, okay? and then they are focused by a lens, Okay, onto the sample which I want to study. And then this is a photodiode which I am using to detect the transmitted light and I can use another photodiode in the reflection. Which means R is absorption, okay, R is reflection, P is transmittancy and A is absorption should all be equal to 1. Okay. So, if I measure R plus T, I can also measure what is absorption. So, the critical component in this whole thing is, now we are having two beams which are coming from this mirror here, focused on by this lens here 
onto the sample here. Okay. Now these two uh, beams are divided by this beam splitter here. Right? It's divided, so the light is coming in. Okay, in pulses, and from each pulse you have millions of photons. So some part of the uh, light is some few number of photons are sent in the, in this direction, and few photons are sent and in this direction. Okay. So you are splitting your each photon or each pulse into two parts. One is reflected and one is transmitted. And that is coming here and then falling here. Now what we do is, this is known as a stepper motor delay stage. So there is a stepper motor with 100 nanometer precision. What this does is, like, so you can actually get the time difference between the two pulses. One pulse is coming here, one part of the pulse is going here. Now these two parts of the same pulse, we can make sure that they are reaching at the sample at the same time, which we call the zero time. Okay? So that is, the, the photons are all, all the pulses in, in one single pulse here, which is split into one pulse which is in this part, one pulse which is in this part. Now we are sending, mixing them together, we separated them into two parts and making sure that they both come to the sample at the same time. At my stage, so the middle position on this stage, right, we can control precisely right, what is the separation in time between the pulse, which is the part of the pulse which is going in this part, and what is the, the part of the pulse, I mean the part So you can control the separation between the time at which they are arriving on the sample. So if one is used as a pump, the second pulse which is delayed here by this, right, that will be used to probe right, how many electrons are still in the excited state, how many are in the ground state, so that can be probed by the this second pulse which is coming from this arm. So this is known as pump probe technique. Okay. So you can use similar technique uh, to measure, for example, an electron from valence band to the connection band. So the electron in the connection band recombines with the hole in the valence band and emits a photon out. So that is the uh, that's the photoluminescence or fluorescence. So by using another nonlinear technique, this fluorescence. Sorry, yes, please. Is there a question? Yes, please. Okay, great. So what we do is like so we put a nonlinear crystal. I'll show it here. crystal, beta barium borate. So this is a nonlinear crystal where if two red photons fall on it, so then we can generate one blue photon. So we can add two red photons to generate one blue photon out. Okay. So uh, it happens only when both the photons, like if one photon from the pump pulse and one photon from the flow pulse, they come at the same time then only you can generate the blue. Okay? So if the delay is not correct, okay? so then, then you will not get a blue light. So we use this second order process, it's called second harmonic generation, to find out the time difference between the pump and the flow pulses. Once we know that t equal to zero, then we can estimate the um, estimate the time delay and then what is the signal with respect to different delays. Another critical thing uh, which we do is uh, single photon detection. Okay? So I said there is APDs and then uh, the avalanche photodiodes, each uh, triggered uh, avalanche will give a pulse of bunch of uh, uh, or, or a strong current which um, pulse which comes in. So we measure that and uh, say that uh, each 
current pulse will correspond to one single photon. So, but how do we know whether we have single photon or not? And as I said, this light which we have around us, it will have billions of photons, hundreds of crores of photons. And if we dim more light, there's still like tens of thousands of from somewhere or other. So the laser beam gets uh, scattered from some dust particle and then that gives some uh, ray light. Okay? That itself will have hundreds or thousands of photons. So how do we make sure that like, we have a single photon in our, uh, in, in our beam, beam of light? Okay? So how do we check is, uh, for example, Sure you can have here, but okay. so the trick which we do is so we have a beam coming in, okay. We put again a beam splitter which has which reflects fifty percent and transmits fifty percent. So we put one here, we put another here. Okay. So if you have one pulse which is having one photon, this photon can either go to detector one or it can go to detector two. It cannot you cannot split photon in So what we measure is the probability as a function of time, we measure the probability of finding photon in both detector 1 and detector 2. If we find photon in both, both the detectors, which means we have more than one photon in our incident pulse. But if you have only one single photon, the probability of finding at the same time in both detector 1 and detector 2 will be zero. So if you measure the probability, you get zero probability. trying to say is like so one single photon pulse is coming for a pulse photon is coming that photon will either go into detector one or it can go to detector two so by measuring the probability of finding photon in both d1 and d2 at the same time so here what we are plotting is probability versus time so at time t equal to zero, that is this length and this length are the same, so the photon travels same distance in both the arms, then we'll get zero probability in of the probability of finding photon at the same time in both the detectors is zero. Then we know that like so okay, there's only one photon in my incident pulse. So the probability here is non-zero at t not equal to zero is non-zero because your pulse is not a single pulse, but you have many pulses. Okay. At non-zero time delay, one photon from this pulse may go to detector 2. And the first photon, photon from the first pulse may go to detector 1. But these two are traveling at different times. Okay. Because this is from a later time. So these two, so t equal, not equal to zero means, so these are coming at different times. So different pulses are coming to different photon, different detectors and you are getting a non-zero probability. But for a given pulse at t equal to zero, the probability will be zero. Then we know that, that we have a single photon. So, 
this point, um, Professor Prabhu, he works on terahertz spectroscopy. So we both uh, uh, share that. So uh, as I said, so terahertz is the bridge between the photonics and the electronics. So they use a, a very high intense laser. So um, to use again a nonlinear crystal. So but he, here instead of uh, using summing two photon energies, so they make use of the difference between the two photon energies. So for example, uh, one 800 nanometer, one 801 nanometer um, wavelength light photons. So they subtract their energy from each other and then they generate the terahertz, which is uh, typically in the in the order of like say the wavelength of the uh, wavelength of terahertz is in the order of one terahertz is about three hundred micrometers to wavelength. Say in the order of like micro electron volt. So they use that laser and use again the nonlinear optics to generate terahertz. Or they also use something known as antenna. So in which like you excite uh, electron hole pairs and make them go at extreme um, high speeds like so the the uh, the traveling electrons they generate a radiation uh, which is in the terahertz uh, uh, domain. Okay. So uh, okay. so there are again different ways. So like the CW continuous wave uh, laser so and the pulse uh, uh, laser Okay, so here also you can get PW terahertz or you can generate uh, uh, pulse terahertz. So they are using pulse terahertz, uh, generating pulse terahertz using the pulse laser, uh, which is at say 800 nanometers. There is also another source which are, again like, so these are fiber bright grating, um, bright lasers. Okay. Fiber lasers are used to generate uh, uh, this difference frequency between two different lasers and generate Continuous wave terahertz, which is which can be used for uh, generating like um, radiation in the uh, in the terahertz range. So you can get continuous wave radiation using this. So how do you detect? So this is a this gold looking one is a is called a bolometer. A bolometer uses uh, basically it's a very high purity uh, silicon, which is at uh, very very low temperature, say two Kelvin. And uh, when the radiation, when the electromagnetic field or the terahertz falls on, on the silicon piece, so its resistance changes. The change in resistance is measured and then calibrated with how much is the intensity which is falling on it. So this is known as a bolometer, and uh, people also use the uh, what is known as electro-optic technique. In which this is the uh, CW. Uh, there is a time domain spectroscopy and can do. So the electrophic technique basically what they use is uh, yeah. So so basically. They have a crystal here. Is you can see, and then there is this uh, antenna here which generates the terahertz. So the 800 nanometer pumps pumps the antenna and then generates the terahertz, which goes onto the sample, and the transmitted light goes goes into uh, into the um, into a uh, Electro-optic crystal whose optic axis is with respect to the is uh, um, modified with respect to the applied electric field. So the terahertz is like the electric uh, field which you are applying. It's like the voltage pulse which you are giving. So the the optic ax optic axis of the crystal changes with the, um, the the intensity of the terahertz which is falling. So the amplitude of the terahertz can be um, measured using by using this technique called electro-optic technique and um, so uh, if you measure it as a function of time you can get E electric field as a function of time so 
by doing the Fourier transform of it, you can get the spectral information, which is E as a function of uh, omega. So the time and the frequency are related by the Fourier transform. So you measure E as a function of time, and then you do the Fourier transform to get uh, electric field as a function of uh, frequency or the spectral information. Can yes, quickly show Function system. Sputtering is uh, basically you generate plasma. Okay? In our case, like we use an argon plasma, and we um, and and then we apply. So basically, we um, pump the this chamber to very high uh, vacuum of, of the order of a. The pressure inside will be of the order of a 10 to the minus 9 millibar, and then we introduce argon gas. And then we apply a very high electric field of the uh, bias of, of the order of like kilovolts to arc plasma. So the uh, the argon inert gas is uh, converted to uh, plasma. Argon ions are generated, and then you see it flow in the chamber. Okay. Then <coughs> this plasma goes. Uh, I mean, so basically interacts with the uh, target material which is there. For example, if you want to deposit silicon. Okay. The silicon target is, is basically sputtered or etched at each. Um, so uh, you can generate like the, the um, there's something called magnetron sputtering which we do. So there is a magnetic uh, field also which is applied, which makes this, uh, the electrons which are uh, free electrons which are there in the <coughs> target material, like so they are uh, removed and then they go and accelerate. Uh, because of the bias, right, your substrate on which you want to deposit is at, uh, say, positive voltage, and then whatever is in the target is at the negative voltage. So you are uh, you are accelerating the electrons from the target to the substrate, and then these basically will uh, interact with your surface of your sample. Either you can use it for etching, what I said, or the other way, like by changing the polarity, you can accelerate the electrons towards the target, which will Yes, please. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. I'm sure. I'm sure, yes. behind the target, so we get these electrical uh, paths for the electrons. 
So, and because of the bias, the electrons are also accelerated towards the uh, towards the anode. लेकिन जब ये actually हो रहा है तो it it basically gets scattered. The electrons get scattered and and the remove the remove the atoms from the target and then they are deposited on the uh, substrate. Okay. So uh, that's how this uh, sputtering works. So um, we can deposit like few nanometer thickness because most uh, unlike electronics, like so where hundred nanometer or or one micron doesn't make much of a difference. Optical is me. We need nanometer precision. Me chahiye. So we we deposit. हेलो Can you hear me? Yes. But then, which may have cut the edges or cut the border. So, ab uh, abhi I'll, I'll stop here. So, which uh, questions are there? We uh, we can discuss. Only one question is there. Uh, is there always internal reflection in materials? Metal materials. Okay. Sorry, uh, could you please repeat? Uh, sir, so, uh, is there always internal reflection in metal materials? Uh, no. Um, we can we can design it uh, in any possible way. Like so, metal material may. Um, You can design its reflection, transmission, sub of my own mercy to design it. So total internal reflection, exact uh, exact plasmons exact करने के लिए चाहिए. If you have prism geometry, right? लेकिन उसकी ज़रूरत वैसे तो नहीं है. If you have periodic structure, 
तो प्रिज्म ज्योमेट्री की जरूरत नहीं है देन यू डोंट नीड टेन टोटल इंटरनल रिफ्लेक्शन ये अभी आपको टाइम है तो मैं जा सकता हूँ ओके ओके एक्चुअली मेरा मोबाइल का भी या नहीं नहीं आ, कुछ तो प्रॉब्लम है वो अपने नेटवर्क पर नहीं पकड़ रहा है तो मैं मैं ट्राई करता हूँ फिर से मेरा मोबाइल और लैपटॉप दोनों नया है तो ओके 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 तो अभी और कुछ क्वेश्चन है तो अभी बात कर सकते हैं प्लीज डिस्कस मोर अबाउट द मैजिक अप और देयर इज एनी रूल बैंड गैप देयर मैजिक कप नहीं मैजिक कप क्या है नेहा, आई कैन सी यू कैट बॉक्स नेहा स्विच ऑन योर मोबाइल ओके सर कैन यू डिस्कस मोर अबाउट मैजिक कप और देर इज एनी रोल बैंड गैप देर मैजिक कप क्या है आई डोंट नो What is magic cup? Ruby crystal cup, sir. Ruby uh, crystal. Uh, magic cup? No, uh, I mean I don't know. Ah, okay. Magic cup. Ah, in that, there is no band gap. In that, band gap is not there. It is only the scattering. It is the metal nanoparticles that scattering is because of the different colors. Okay. तो जैसे मैंने बताया था मेटल नैनो पार्टिकल लिया तो उसका रिफ्लेक्शन और ट्रांसमिशन कलर कलर अलग होता है नहीं तो उसकी वजह से हमको रिफ्लेक्शन और ट्रांसमिशन में अलग कलर्स आता है यस पर ये जो सुनामी लेजर आपने बताया और इसकी सर स्पेशलिटी क्या है जैसे ये सुनामी और सिंपल दूसरे लेजर से ये क्या स्पेशल है इसमें वाई इट इज नेम सुनामी सुनामी ब्रांड नेम है ओके तो लेकिन इसमें टाइटेनियम सफर क्रिस्टल है उसमें सोलसेड लेजर है उसका यूनिकनेस ये है कि अपना लेजिंग एक्शन के लिए क्या होता है कि गेन मीडियम बीच में है और लेजर बीम आगे पीछे आगे पीछे लाइट जो होम बीम है आगे पीछे आगे पीछे जा रहे हैं और मल्टीपल राउंड्स में हमको ईच टाइम वो ट्रांसन होता है लाइक इलेक्ट्रॉन्स एक्साइट हो रहा है और डीएमिट हो रहा है तो उसकी वजह से एम्पलीफिकेशन हो रहा है तो ये मैचिंग होने की जरूरत है मैचिंग होना बहुत जरूरी है कैविटी लेंथ और वेव लेंथ का तो वो वो बाकी लेजर्स में बहुत मुश्किल होता है बहुत क्रिटिकल होता है ये कैविटी लेंथ कितना आना है लेकिन इसमें ब्रॉडबैंड एमिशन आता है उसकी वजह से इट्स कॉल्ड लाइक बेसिकली वो अपने आप को लॉक हो जाता है पल्स ट्रेन के लिए जैसे मैं सुबह के ऑन किया और ऊपर एक कपड़ मारा जाए अपने आप वो लॉक हो जाता है और पल्सेस आ जाते
we have to switch to the other window of mobile so sir has changed uh, from the desktop to mobile so that is at the bottom you click you have to click on the or pin or pin this uh, window to see it हेलो यस 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 सर Yes sir. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. So, um, somebody asked a question about optical mixing. Yes, we do optical mixing. SHG is one of optical mixing techniques. In addition to semi-normally, we can do four-way mixing and other colors also. Different colors we mix them. For example, as I said, like photoluminescence or the fluorescent signal, we mix it with the, uh, the reference beam. Uh, and then uh, we can generate a uh, uh, I mean, uh, and the different uh, some frequency or different frequency, and then that uh, we can dissolve the fluorescence in time as well. Okay, so this is our uh, room. This is a class thousand clean room. Uh, the, the class of the clean room is defined by number of particles, dust particles, which are inside the uh, room. So, uh, it is like about not more than thousand particles of size point five micron or bigger. Right. Okay. So, uh, how do we do it? So, we have something called HEPA filters. We all know now, thanks to COVID, there are HEPA filters which are on the top. So, the air flows from the top, filtered by those HEPA filters, and then go to the Go to the bottom layers, uh, which are at the bottom, and then recirculate it. The same air is recirculated with uh, very little uh, fresh air, which is mixed from the outside. Okay, because of this uh, uh, multiple cycles of same uh, air which is passing through the filters, we get after seven cycles, we get less than 500 particles, dust particles inside the room. Okay. So once we have this, so we have uh, an optical microscope there, okay. and uh, this one on, on the left hand side. So uh, what you see there is uh, known as uh, a um, mask aligner or an optical lithography system, where a UV light is used and a mask is used to the pattern from the uh, mask to the uh, substrate. Right? So, this is a standard technique which is used in uh, electronic industry. Nowadays, it's all soft uh, mask which is used, but UV light or deep UV light is used to go to uh, 
high resolution uh, uh, or sub micron features which are possible. So this one here, so this here is long one. This is an electron beam evaporation system which is used for generating metals and okay? uh, uh, depositing metals. Sorry, the one uh, there in the corner, the at the top, like so. This one, the ray. So that's an electron beam photography system which is used for patterning uh, sub micron. So we can get up to like uh, 20, 30 nanometer features we can uh, easily make by patterning structures using this uh, uh, system here. And these two here, so what you see here, they are the symbol and uh, this one. So these two are basically a uh, reactive ion etching and a chemical vapor deposition systems. So in the reactive ion etching, so we can etch uh, using the uh, sputter, similar to sputter thing, we can excite the plasma and the plasma can be used to etch the substrate. Instead of depositing something on the substrate, here we etch the substrate out. Okay. So this is the plasma enhanced reactive ion etching and this is the uh, sputter, uh, this is chemical paper deposition for the silicon, silicon nitride and, and uh, uh, different materials. And so this is an atomic layer deposition system. So here, like we can uh, basically uh, throw deposit layer by layer. One atom layer by one layer is possible using this atomic layer deposition system. Okay. So if you see one unique feature, is that like how we maintain uh, the uh, cleanliness inside the material is like if you touch here, like so what we can feel is air coming out. So the pressure inside the room is higher then the pressure outside because of this positive pressure. So, nothing goes in from outside into the uh, inside of the clean room. Okay? So, because of that uh, partial uh, positive pressure, so we maintain uh, the difference between the outside and the inside and uh, it has its dedicated air handling unit. Okay? So, it circulates the air uh, through the system, so there are ducts there which take pump the air in, and then uh, the air gets sucked back, and then again recycled. So, so after seven cycles, we get uh, this clean air. And here is a changing room. So, because it's a clean room, uh, even our hair and uh, uh, other things, ye uh, 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 dust particles be uh, both uh, affect karta hai. So, isliye. We have to wear a garment, gloves, and hat cover. We have to wear a hat cover. We have to change this air shower. This is the steel jet. We have to wear an air jet. So, we have to wear a dress. We have to wear a dress. We have to wear a dress. We have to wear a so, here mat B, which is a sticky mat, and which is under the shoe, which is dust, it goes in the shoe. So, we take as much clear as possible. So, now it's the edges. Sometimes it's the edges. Sometimes it's the edges. Sometimes it's the edges. Like in the house, in the wall, in the wall, in the flooring, in the wall, where it's the edges. 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 So, you have to put a smooth edges in the head to put up a polymer finish. So, the scale of take a characterization room. So, this room is a dedicated room. This is a whole flooring of the polymer cleaning. So, this is an AFM atomic coat microscope. So, here is a propylometer. This is a silent space. This is a silent space. Basically, it is a surface space. पूरा वो स्कैन मार के ऊपर नीचे जाता है लेकिन यहाँ पे कोई ऑब्जेक्शन आया तो ऊपर जाता है नहीं तो फिट पे है तो थोड़ा नीचे जाता है तो उसकी वजह से हमको पूरा टोपोग्राफी 
सरफेस कैसा है वो ये सरफेस प्रोफाइलर होता है तो एफ एम में भी डिस्प्यूज करते हैं या फिर डिस्प्यूज करते हैं लेकिन यहाँ पे कुछ पोस्ट रहता है वहाँ पे लाइक हमको एल्सोमीटर से हमको थिकनेस या रिफ्रैक्टिव इंडेक्स मेजर कर सकते हो रोटेशन है रोटेशन में हमको इलेक्ट्रिकल मेजरमेंट आई बी सी बी ये सब मेजर कर सकते हैं इसमें रूम टेम्परेचर टू लो टेम्परेचर मेजरमेंट कर सकते हैं इसमें ये एक रैपिड सर्वर इनिटर है तो कई बार हमको जो डिपॉजिट किया लेयर वो ठीक से नहीं आता है उसको एनील करने से टेम्परेचर डीट करने से उसका क्रिस्टलिटी या सर्फेस बेटर हो जाता है तो उसके लिए हमको एनील करना पड़ता है तो इसलिए ये रैपिड सर्वर एनीलर है और ये और एक दो चैम्बर से ये वाटर चैम्बर से तो ये फेसिलिटीज है हमारे पास यहाँ पे हम नैनो फैब्रिकेशन कर सकते हैं पैटर्निंग कर सकते हैं इलेक्ट्रॉनिक लिथोग्राफी या ऑप्टिकल लिथोग्राफी माइक्रोमीटर से लेके टेन नैनोमीटर रेजोल्यूशन तक हम मेजर कर सकते हैं एनी क्वेश्चन मैं कह कर आंसर पर ये क्लीन रूम का सिग्निफिकेंस क्या है यहाँ पर हम कोई क्रिस्टल वगैरह लिथोग्राफी तो करते ही हैं और इसका और कौन कौन सा यूज है सर तो इसमें बेसिकली हमको जहाँ पे रियली फाइन फीचर्स करना है इलेक्ट्रॉनिक्स में हमको पता है अभी एक डस्ट पार्टिकल जाके बैठ गया तो पूरा डिवाइस खराब हो जाता है और शॉर्ट हो जाता है तो ऑप्टिक्स में भी सेम है लाइक अभी एक डस्ट पार्टिकल बैठा अपना सब नाइनो सब माइक्रोमीटर फीचर है तो टेन नाइनोमीटर ट्वेंटी नाइनोमीटर फीचर है उसके ऊपर लाइक फाइव हंड्रेड माइक्रोन का एक डस्ट पार्टिकल बैठा तो पूरा खराब हो जाता है राइट बिकॉज वहां से अपना लाइट स्कैटर होता है तो वो अवॉइड करने के लिए हमको क्लीन रूम की जरूरत है क्लीन रूम में हमको डिवाइस कैरेक्टराइजेशन भी करते हैं तो ऑल इनिशियल कैरेक्टराइजेशन इसी में करते हैं कि सब ठीक है क्लीन है सरफेस इसके ऊपर लाइक वो कंट्रोल कर कई बार वो वैक्यूम बॉक्स में यहाँ से ले जाके अपना मेजरमेंट सिस्टम में डालते हैं तो तो बेसिकली क्लीन एनवायरनमेंट ताकि डिवाइस खराब ना हो ओके थैंक यू सर कई बार हमको इंस्ट्रूमेंट खोलना भी पड़ता है जैसे की फॉर एग्जाम्पल कई लैब्स से कुछ वेरी स्पेशल डिवाइसेस आता है जैसे कि सोलर पैनल जो स्पेस में जाके आया है उसमें रेडिएशन डिटेक्शन हमको देखना है रेडिएशन डैमेज कितना है वो देखना पड़ेगा तो उसके लिए हमको यहाँ के क्लीन रूम में उनको डिवाइस का बायास करके देखते हैं ताकि दस पार्टिकल्स की इफेक्ट कम ना हो कम हो सर जब तक कोई और क्वेश्चन पूछता है मेरा एक और क्वेश्चन भी था सर हेलो हेलो सर जो आपने वो पीकॉक इधर के बारे में बताया था वो कलर का वो कंसेप्ट था तो उसको आप सर रिपीट कर सकते हैं तब वो क्लैरिटी ऑफ साउंड नहीं था थोड़ी डिस्टरबेंस थी उस टाइम पे तो ओके ओके पीकॉक फैलर में हम ये देखते हैं कि डिफरेंट कलर्स है ग्रीन है ब्लू है लेकिन ग्रीन कलर में भी बहुत सारे शेड्स होते हैं ब्लू कलर में भी लाइट डार्क ब्लू होता है डिफरेंट डिफरेंट शेड्स आता है तो ये कैसे आएगा तो इसमें एक तो करके मटीरियल 
question from uh, participants otherwise we will uh, there is a question from priya mm. you can directly so, ask yeah. mm. priya you can ask the question directly to sir by keeping your mic on okay. sir why the laser beam meant that about 100 meters up when we point it in the sky okay. तो एक दो, दो रीजंस है एक तो स्कैटरिंग हो जाता है क्योंकि इतना सारा डस्ट पार्टिकल्स है अपने इसमें कि वो स्कैटर हो जाता है उसकी वजह से इंटेंसिटी कम होती जाता है एक टाइम पे हमारा आई का रिजोल्यूशन उतना नहीं देख सकते हैं तो हमको वो दिखेगा नहीं लेकिन और, और भी लाइक फ्यू फोटो जा, जाते रहते हैं और भी लेकिन हम नहीं देख सकते हाई इंटेंस लेजर्स और कई बार लाइक जापान में यहाँ पे लोग बहुत परेशान हो गए थे कई साल पहले कि अरे स्काई में कुछ तो लाइक वेरी ब्राइट लाइट हो जा रहा है और वो इधर उधर ऐसे ऐसे हो रहा है तो है किस पार्टिकल्स लेकिन की वजह से वो उसका इंटेंसिटी कम हो सकता है ओके नाउ आई इनवाइट डॉक्टर विकास दुग्गल Uh, sir, we can conclude. Can we conclude now, Dr. Gopal? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So now I invite Dr. Vikas Dugalji to uh, propose vote of thanks. Oh, thank you, sir. Uh, 
गुड आफ्टरनून एवरीवन इट्स माय प्रिविलेज टू हैव बीन आस्क्ड टू परपोज अ वोट ऑफ थैंक्स ऑन टुडेज ओकेजन आई ऑन द बिहाफ ऑफ डीएवी कॉलेज मैनेजिंग कमेटी न्यू दिल्ली एंड डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ फिजिक्स डीएवी कॉलेज बठिंडा एक्सटेंड अ हार्टी वोट ऑफ थैंक्स टू आवर मोस्ट वैल्यूड इनवाइटेड गेस्ट डॉक्टर वीनू गोपाल जी थैंक यू सर फॉर एक्वेंटिंग आवर स्टूडेंट्स विद वास्ट रिसर्च एवेन्यू इन ऑप्टिक्स एंड फिटनेस मेड फिजिक्स वी अप्रिशिएट योर एफर्ट्स इन एटिंग दिस वर्चुअल टूर अ सक्सेस वी एक्सपेक्ट our audience has greatly benefited from this tour of research lab in our country's premier institute so your medium thank you sir thank you very much thank you very much to all the participants thank you regarding yeah. there is one announcement regarding the participation certificate i will share the link to uh, your uh, uh, whatsapp group also so if you wait i will share the link in the chat box too so thank you sir thank you very much Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you.